Dunnies have ever received a phone call that you really enjoy getting? Any of you guys ever received that phone call? And everything about it, you say, it was an exciting phone call. I remember when I got out, or when I was just getting ready to get out of the service, and I got a phone call from Hughes Aircraft Company, and to me that was an exciting day. Why? Because I am getting ready to get out of the service, and I received this phone call, and the phone call says, we want you to come in for a job interview, and I will never forget that I was so excited to receive that phone call to go to work for a Hughes Aircraft Company. Man, I'm just getting ready to get out of the service. And so I go to the interview, and I'm nervous, and I'm excited, and everything else about me. And all I can do was think of how important that call was to me in my life. And so I worked for Hughes because it changed my life for 10 years. And then I remember another uh, call that I got. And it said, we would like to talk to you, and we would like you to come to work for California Department of Corrections. And that call changed my life for 20 and a half years. So any of you guys have ever received a calling that changes your life and affects you in every aspect of your life? Any of you guys ever received that call? It's exciting, isn't it? Did you know that uh, what this here is representing is what? Any of you guys have any clues? Kathy? You ever seen that before? What does that represent? Where have you seen it, maybe? Oh, yeah, I've seen it at Point Loma. Ah, Point Loma! And what is this supposed to represent to us? The what? It's the calling, right? Jesus calling Peter, because why? We're all fishermen. men. And this little statue, to me, is pretty important. Why? Because it represents what God has called me to do. It's when I was ordained, they gave me this. And they actually give all the Nazarene pastors when they're ordained one. So you know, I had to take it off the shelf and I had to blow all the dust off it so I could put it up here today. But that's not what I'm talking about. The calling that you and I have in our life, God has called us. And it's more exciting than receiving a phone call from Hughes Aircraft Company. It's more exciting than receiving that phone call from uh, going to uh, work for the California Department of Corrections. And when I went to my job interview with Hughes Aircraft, I was excited. Why? Because I thought, finally, I was going to be leaving the state of California, and I was going to be working for a huge aircraft company in New Mexico, and that's really what I wanted. So as I went into the interview, I'm sitting in there, and uh, Jerry Lippman, he asked me, he says, so how much do you want to make an hour? Wow, that's exciting. I'm just getting out of the Navy where I was not making Jack Diddley squat, and here I have an open invitation. Man, I'm thinking, well, I worked quite a little bit. So I threw the question back on Jerry. I said, how much are you willing to pay a man with my expertise and skills in this field? How about $9.47 an hour? Praise God, that is a good wage. I'll take it. $9.47 an hour when I was getting out of the Navy after only making, well, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You know, I was making very little while I was in the service. And here I had that opportunity. Minimum wage back then was $5.75 an hour. I'm making a great salary. I was excited. Man, how many of you guys remember your first job and how much you made? My first paying job, I think I was making $1.35 an hour minimum wage. Well, yeah, minimum wage I think was $1.35. But here's the thing. We are called, you and I are called to do what? To serve God. 
So this morning we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew, chapter 4. And we read it as we came into service this morning. And in verse 4 of 8, uh, yeah, chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in a boat fishing. Wow. And immediately when Jesus called, they laid down everything and to follow Jesus. The calling that we have in our life should excite us just a little bit. Man, if I could get excited about going to work for a huge aircraft, and when I went to work for the prison system, it was definitely more than 9.47 an hour 10 years later. Man, I actually left uh, that job and I took a pay cut of 32 cents an hour to go to work for a huge or to leave Hughes and to go to work for the prison system. But in doing that, I had full benefits. And it wasn't too long before that 32 cents an hour was more than double. The calling that we receive in our line should be exciting to us. And here we have Jesus. He says, I'm calling you. He says, I want you to lay down everything, empty everything, and follow me because it's going to be an exciting journey. He says, I want you to follow me. He says, the calling that I have for you in your life is important. And it's kind of interesting to me that the first four people that he called are fishermen. Fishermen. How many of you guys like fishing? How many of you guys catch anything when you go fishing? I can't say that I catch anything when I go fishing. The fish are safe. They look at me and they say, man, if I'm fishing with you, Roger, you and I can be sitting side by side, and the fish are going to go to Roger's hooks. And over on the other side, it might be, uh, you know, it might be Randy, or it might be Bill, or it might be Philip sitting there, and we're all fishing in the same spot, but those fish will not bite my hook. We're using the same bait. We have everything that's the same, but they do not come on my hook. Is that what it is? I knew there was something wrong with it. See, there's a trick to it. And but God has called you and I to become fishers of men, and immediately they lay down everything that they have to follow Jesus. And then the large crowd began to follow Jesus. And they were seeing the things that were going on, and Jesus looked down and he saw the crowd. And then he sat down with his disciples in chapter 5. And he says, if I'm calling you, he says, here's some things that we need to get straight. And they're called the Beatitudes. So we go into Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Jesus, I don't understand what you're saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Did he say that we have to be poor? No. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, why? He says, you guys will inherit the entire world. You will inherit the kingdom of God. Here he's just called them, and they were excited about what was going on in their life to receive that call. And then he sits down and he begins to teach them, blessed are the poor in spirit. Man, we kind of scratch our head on that and say, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't really make sense. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Man, I, I don't understand that. Man, what are you telling me? And remember that we last week we had looked at Jesus himself coming in and receiving the call for him to accept the form of humanity at the baptism because Christ himself did not need to be baptized. 
And here are those disciples. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What are you talking about? Blessed are the poor in spirit. What he's really saying is, if you really want to follow Christ, come and empty everything that you have in your life and follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Why? Because if we are poor in spirit, in other words, you, have you guys ever known anybody that runs around, oh, look how religious I am. Oh, look what I did this week. If you haven't, I've known a few people like that. And what Christ is saying, he said, it's not about the religion. He says, it comes to that point in our life. I've called you. He says, I want you to completely empty everything in your life so that you can come to me. And he says, when you come to me, he says, you have a greater kingdom than what is here. He says, I promise you that we're going to do that. Did you know that you and I are going to be judges? Did you know that? We will judge the world. You say, Dave, how can you say that? Because after the second coming, after we are raptured, after all that time period, we who have gone to be with Christ will become judges. Why? Because the kingdom of God is more than you and I have here on this earth. And Christ is saying, if you will just empty everything and come and follow me, he says, I promise you that it's going to be worth everything if you empty me and empty yourself of all the world, not empty of you. But empty yourself of all the crud that we have in our life and come to God completely in a pure heart. And see, we can look in the book of First or Second Corinthians. Chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, our servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles and hardships and distress, in beatings and imprisonments, and riots and hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, and purity and understanding, the patience and kindness, and the Holy Spirit and sincere love and truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, and through the glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine and regard for impostors, known yet. And it says, regard as unknown dying, and we live or beaten and are not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor and making rich, having nothing but possessing everything. We might be poor in the world's point of view, but if we have Christ in our life, we have everything. Isn't that exciting to you? You see, the message that Christ is giving to his disciples goes against the world. It was going against the world then, it's going against the world today. And the disciples, they were thinking, blessed are they who are poor in spirit? I'm sure they scratched their heads. I'm sure they would say, what are you really talking about? And what he was talking about is being completely empty so that God can fill us. Wow. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, you know, Jesus, this doesn't sound like something I really want to do. Blessed are they that mourn, so they will be comforted. Man, that goes against what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, I remember that you said you would never leave me nor forsake me, regardless of what I go through in my life. And see, the disciples, they started thinking about that. Well, if God was with Daniel in the lion's den, and if God was with Joseph when he was thrown in the pit and sold into slavery, and if God was with Moses, and if God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
in the fiery furnace. Man, and do you tell me that I can be blessed because I can mourn? Blessed are they that mourn because they will be comforted. And he comes in and he says, I want you to know that just because you're going through things, he says, I will be with you. Kathy this morning was asking a scripture that gets us through. And for me, it's Joshua 1 9. But I think the disciples probably started thinking about Joshua. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you will be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. <laughs> and in verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And here they have Jesus saying, Blessed are they that mourn after, he, after I receive my calling. God, you mean I'm going to go through grief in my life? How many of you have ever gone through grief in your life? How many of you have lived a, per a perfect life? How many of you have ever had troubles that come into your life? And he says, blessed are you that mourn because you will do these. And the disciples are sitting there thinking, man, this is a strange doctrine. You just called me to follow you and empty everything that I had to follow you wholeheartedly. Blessed are they that will mourn. And then he says, blessed are the meek. Wow. Meekness does not mean weakness. When I worked in the prison system, I would tell the inmates, I said, please don't mistake my meekness for a weakness. Is being meek weak? No. And he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is enduring with injury and patience without resentment and not violent or strong. Wow. God, are you sure you, you're calling me into this life of you, you called me? Lord, I've received the call. I know that you called me. And each and every one of us has a call that God has placed upon our life. How many of you guys know that? We have all received that call. But to be meek, in Psalms 35, verses 8 through 11, it says, Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And here he's coming. He said, if you will just empty everything that is in your life and follow me wholeheartedly, he says, I promise you that you're going to have a better life. He says, it may not seem like it, but when you get to heaven for eternity, he says, that's where I'm talking about. He says, you will have eternal life. Man, I, I don't know about this meekness, Lord. And then in verse 11 of Psalms, 35, it says, But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. See, in Zephaniah 3.12, it says, But I will leave within you the meek and the humble, and the remnant of Israel will trust in them. That kind of meekness that I'm talking about, remember I said that we had to completely empty ourselves. It only comes from the Holy Spirit. Because I can't produce that within myself. And so here you have this meekness. Blessed are they that are me, for they shall inherit. Man, am I sure that you are calling me to this lifestyle? Am I sure that the calling is real? And then he goes on. What about for righteousness? Thank you. 
Blessed are they who hunger for and thirst for righteousness. We live in a world today that is separated <coughs> from the truth. Do you guys live in a different world or are you seeing the same thing that I see? We take the truth and we twist it. And when I say we, I'm talking about our society, our culture. I'm not talking about us as individuals. But we start to accept the twisted lies. And we have all those things going on, but Christ has called us to be righteous. He's called us to put a hunger in our soul and in our inner being to be closer to Him. And He says, I promise you that if you hunger after these things, I promise that this, these things, you will inherit the kingdom of God. But the calling that we have goes beyond that. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, brothers and sisters, think of what you were called. Not many of you were wise men or wise to men's standards. Man may look at you and say, Dude, you're as dumb as a box of bones. <clears throat> but God looks at us and he says that you and I are called to a life of righteousness and holiness. He says, I want you to know that this righteous living, if you hunger for it, he says, you're going to be blessed. Man, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And then in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Merciful. Man, any of you guys ever played Mercy growing up as a kid? You know that's a fun game, wasn't it? Not when you on the other end. Ah, <laughs> why is that? Because it hurts. And you would... You play that game. If you don't know how you play it, you kind of got the, that scope. Leon said, and it hurt. So, whenever you were playing Mercy, you were the one that was uh, tormenting. I love that part, right? I didn't like so much being hurt. Why, Mercy, 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 give me Mercy. But God says, Blessed are they that are merciful. In order for you and I to be merciful, we have to have been shown mercy from God himself. Unlike the king, mercy, it did hurt. But 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You and I belong to God, and we are His children. A special possession that you may declare the presence of Him who called you out of darkness, and it is His wonderful light. Once you were in, not a people, but now you are a people, and God Himself has showed mercy upon us. Why do we need to be merciful to others? Because God himself has given us the ability. He's called us to be merciful when we're wrong. It's not always easy to be righteous. It's not always easy to be meek. It's not always easy to do these things that God's called us to do. But blessed are the merciful. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, if that's not enough, he says, I want you to know that I want you to live in a lifestyle of purity. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. Wow. You mean I have to be, you mean I have to have pure motives? When I play that game Mercy, sometimes, oh, I enjoy torturing my brothers. You notice I said my brothers because if I had ever played that game with my sister, my dad would have intervened. And I wasn't that stupid to play that game with my sister. Oh, no. But blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are they that have a pure heart. In other words, God's saying, man, if our motives are pure before the world, we're going to be blessed. Our world today that we live in 
is going to bring us from that. But God has called us to be a people that are pure at heart. He's put that calling in our life. <clears throat> in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith in His grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope and the glory of God. Why? Because we can become peacemakers and have a pure heart in what we're doing. See, and then the next part says that we're supposed to be peacemakers. There is no peace in our world today. However, you and I are called to be peacemakers. In other words, I'm not out there looking for destruction and to destroy people. We're going to live with people. We're going to speak and, and preach the truth. We're going to live a righteous life. We're going to love people. Bucky and I, we were talking the other day. Did you know that we need to invite people who do not know Jesus Christ to our church? Sometimes their lifestyles are not going to be with what ours is. They're deep in sin. But we need to love them. Right, Bucky? We need to love them, right? How many of you guys would like to see our church filled with sinners? Ha, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. And I want our church to be filled with people that are troubled. <clears throat> we may not agree with their lifestyle choices, we may not agree with several things. But God is still a holy God. And he says that we can live a life of purity. And we can live this life as we're going through it. And we can become peacemakers. In other words, man, you can't come to our church. You know, you don't have the right kind of car. Well, take what does that have to do with anything? I'm using that as an example. Why? Because sometimes people that are out there in the world have been so deep in sin and the church beats them up. And we're the furthest from the peacemakers. We're the furthest from the ones that are pure in heart. We're the furthest from those that are me. And then he comes back and he says, well, you know, that's not good enough. He says, I want you to know that blessed are they that are persecuted for the sake of him. Any of you guys been persecuted lately? Can we be persecuted today in the church? I'm sure we can. But it says, blessed are they that are persecuted. Why? Because we're going to go through these things. But I want you to know that if God is on our side, he's called us to empty ourselves and say, God, I empty myself before you. I need you in my life because this is a wicked world and I can't make it on my own. Blessed are they that are persecuted. Well, I don't like that part. I can handle being a peacemaker. I can handle, well, maybe even the meekness. I can handle even hungering for righteousness. But blessed are they that are persecuted. Come on, Dave. Where are we going with this? And it says in verse 11, blessed are them. Well, actually, let's go back to 10. Blessed are those who persecute you because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11, Blessed are you when the people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil because of me. And in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven. See, God has called us. He's called you. He's called me to follow him. Unconditionally. Immediately, they left everything. You and I have a calling in our life. And I've heard, well, I've read about people that said, well, I live by the Beatitudes. That's my religion. It's a whole lot harder to live a religion than it is to live a life in Christ. Why? Because Christ sets us free. He's called us. 
He comes and lays his hand on our shoulders. And he says, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to follow me and empty yourself of everything that is in this world. And trust me completely. Why? For purity of heart, for the righteousness, for the meekness. And, you know, I found out that if we had all those things, it really produces the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the uh, Spirit are what? Love. What else are they? Joy. Anybody else? Peace. Long-suffering. What? Gentleness. Oh, I don't like that one, so we're going to scratch that. But see, God has placed upon our life a calling for us to follow Him. And I want you to know that when we accept that calling, we will be persecuted. I'm not talking just because of a hat that we wear. We're living in a world that has twisted our truth. We live in a world that has done all these things. And unless we can come to Christ and empty everything that we have, we might miss what the real calling is. But he's called us to follow him unconditionally. If you would stand with me this morning. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you that you gave the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, you sit down with your disciples on that mountain. You saw the crowds that were following you. And you began to teach the disciples that the calling that you called us to is different than the world's calling. God, you called us into a life that we need to completely empty all the junk in our life and surrender to you. Lord, so that we could be peacemakers. And Father, I know that there's times that it's hard to be peacemakers. God, there's people that I've run across that it's hard to bring peace to. Lord, it's hard sometimes to be me. Lord, it's sometimes hard to have a pure heart. Because God, within myself, they hurt me. And Lord, I want to see that hurt as well. But God, that's not what you've called us to do. Lord, you've called us to follow you. You've given us the ability, Father, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And God, that we and go through the things, the persecution. Lord, and the persecutions I'm talking about are, it's more than, man, you're ugly. But God, we're going to be persecuted, and Lord, I ask that you would just give us the strength, because we know our reward is great. Father, I ask that you would help us to take Jesus into our community. Lord, that each and every one of us would be able to invite unsafe friends to our church. Lord, not have to worry, well, I don't know if they're going to be accepted there because they have purple hair. And God, we ask, Lord, that we'd be able to invite our friends and our family, Lord, to church because you're a God who cares about us and you've called us to follow you. Lord, I ask that you just watch over us Jesus' name, amen.